incredible experience. I mean, truly incredible. In fact, I, I, this year, I didn't bring a bunch of servers in our booth. I just brought a bunch in here we are, so you can see what we're rendering on those things. It is phenomenal. Um, and as we sort of expand our, our repertoire of how we approach light field rendering and holographic rendering, um, certainly we're going to be looking at doing full light field cameras, but what we're really thinking is going to be the future of this um, pipeline is going to be synthetic rendering. Um, and so what, I've got to basically play too many video, and I think it'll be sort of self-explanatory, and after that I'll, I'll follow up with what we're doing in the space. Something that Otoy did a test render for this, and they actually added a feature to their Octane renderer that builds stereo panoramas in this absolutely peak quality for Gear VR version, where it uses our QMAP format for the overlay shaders, and perfectly sampled, perfectly set up, and those are literally the best images I have ever seen through any VR headset anywhere. They are. They have, if you've seen some of Otoy's work, they have some, uh, the things that show off ray tracing, semi-transparent stuff, reflections, ambient, uh, you know, good global illumination, and they've got some, like a kitchen scene and a bedroom scene, and I see people that will just sit there, and they're like, I could stay in this kitchen for hours just looking at how high quality the, the renderings are. But what's important about this is this is sort of our benchmark. So we can say with this exact display, we can hit this level of fidelity that is incredibly good. So we can start approaching that with our real-time rendering and you know, eventually be able to be doing that level of quality both for captured things in the more general form of light fields. I should also mention that uh, when I saw Otoy's light field work, I went into it, as with so many things, you know, the secret to, to happiness is reasonable expectations. You know, I went in with, I had seen some lumographs and light field work before that was generally kind of a blurry mess. It was the sort of thing where you look at this and it's like, okay, it's neat that you can rotate it around and view it for different things, and you can sort of see the future in it, but you're not actually analyzing the quality of the thing in front of you. So I was pleasantly surprised by the light field demos where you know, what I saw was just where you had a, like a picture window that you could look through, but it was captured, it wasn't captured, it was synthetically rendered, but you could move around that, and I was surprised by how good it looked. So, he, he mentioned two things, and there are actually two separate solutions that we come up with for VR, um, both of which are looking incredibly promising. The first one was basically we think high quality rendering for that they saw in the gear VR. That's happening inside of Octane, right? And Octane has been focused on getting real-time rendering to be the absolute best possible quality we can get. I mean, it's unbiased rendering. There's no shortcuts where, you know, we're really working towards rendering reality and not, not looking to, to go down the biased rendering route. I mean, there's definitely a lot of value maybe to that approach, but for us, it's, it's important that we, you know, persevere. Um, and as we get into more complex forms of rendering, as we get into light fields and, and kind of things that VR demands, um, we really, are starting to see the justification of going really deep into not just GP rendering but unbiased rendering as well because we're starting to render just crazy sets of data and caching lighting sets when you're rendering those light fields doesn't make any sense. I mean, you're essentially generating photon maps when you're creating light fields and that whole process probably just start with an unbiased render. So Otoy's mission is in the long term is, is pretty simple. I mean, we just want to make this holographic rendering pipeline a reality as soon as possible. And with VR and AR, emerging and actually exploding so quickly, um, there's, there's an enormous justification for that. And obviously getting people like John Carmack interested has been you know, a really good incentive for us to do this even faster. So I'm going to quickly recap last year. Oh, Octane Render 2.0, big release. I promised you guys then that Octane 2 would be production ready, right? It should be able to replace a CPU renderer, and that would, to me was a really important turning point where we could pretty much drop CPU rendering as a requirement for doing high-end films. And um, I think we got there. I mean, you know, the quality in 2.0 was absolutely amazing, uh, and this, this is something that is, is fantastic. We also rendered by this, by the way, as light fields and holograms now in VR, and it was, I mean, it was so much better than an image. But to get to that point, we really had to make sure Octane was, was an amazing 2D render, amazing you know, film and visual effects render before we started doing these more advanced things. So we got to that point last year, but it took us about a year to finish, I would say, complete the 2.0 cycle. And we wanted to add motion blur, um, displacement mapping, fur, all these things that, that you kind of need to have if you're going to go into a movie um, and, and, and switch from CPU rendering, which has been an issue for decades, to what we know is the future, right? And so I had a test for myself, right, that, that basically said that when we got through out-of-core texture rendering, which was a hard thing to do, we weren't sure that was going to work, but it did work, 
the last thing on our list here, 2.0, was, was doing Oculus VR support. As you can see, that turned out pretty well. Um, but I had one final test, which I started 10 days ago. I went to Barcelona and I basically went to the office of an artist I've been working with for 10 years. He's a legend in the visual effects industry. Uh, he runs a company called VOR. And many of you may have seen his work. I mean, in fact, you know, guys in Rhode Island say, oh my god, you work with JJ at VOR? Like, you know, does he use an octane? And I was like, no, he's been using v for 10 years. And getting him to switch is like telling Yoda 900 years into Star Wars to switch lightsabers. It's really hard. Um, so, so it was a process. I gave myself 10 days, 10 days ago, literally. I just got back from Barcelona a few days ago. And, and you know, he's the Octane 1.5 in a year, I guess, in 2013. So, you know, it's amazing, but it's not production ready. And he gave me the list of things, a lot of which you see in 2.0. Um, and I was very excited to see what happened when we gave him the final version of 2.0. And other than a few driver problems, which, you know, we, we solved, uh, he said, all right, I'm going to take the most complicated scene and my most complicated short, which is Keyboid. I can go to Keyboid and check it out. It's absolutely mind-blowingly awesome. Um, and, you know, so, you know, this is something that, that I have $100,000 worth of, of nodes that render V-Ray, not V-Ray, or normal V-Ray, and it takes about four minutes of frame. So I want to see this one running in Octane. I want to see if we can fit all these things on the GPU. Turns out we need 12 gigs of memory to run in Octane, but when we got it working, uh, it rendered in two minutes on two Titans versus you know, which was what, a thousand bucks? I mean, it's and, and versus a hundred thousand dollars of CPU rendering power. He's got the largest CPU V-Ray render farm in Barcelona. And that was a really awesome moment for all of us. But the thing that was more important than just the fact that the rendering was fast was that during the setup of these scenes, and he would say it would take three days to render, uh, to set up a scene like this because he didn't have the instantaneous feedback we get with an Octane. So that was the big delta and change for him. And once we got that working, once all the keyboard was running in, in Octane, well, then we, then we got into the VR and holographic stuff and that was when things got really cool. Um, and you know, this is just a test I captured on myself. I mean, this is what Octane renders when it's rendering a light bill. This is what Karma was talking about in the you know, DK2. And it's, it's hard to explain a show without you having a VR device, but it is basically a, a portal, and you, you just have this, um, this amazing effect, and it looks incredible in a VR device. Um, and this is not something we can ignore. In fact, we're going to build a product around that, and we're going to approach it in, a, I think, an interesting way, differently than what we've done before. So this is Octane VR. Um, it's basically Octane standalone, uh, and it's an experiment. I mean, we're going to do this for 90 days, we're going to see what happens, and we want to continue it after that. But we're going to make it available to anybody uh, on our website between April and July. It's going to have all the Octane features from 2.2. It's basically the final production-ready version of Octane. It is not a demo version, and it's going to be free for commercial use. You can do anything you want with it. And the reason why we're doing this is that we so strongly believe in this ecosystem around the yard that we feel we need to get people to understand and be aware of it, and we want to open that <laughs> wide open. And we think that with that happening, this is going to get a lot more users in, into Octane. And there's other services we're going to be offering above the standalone. We have cloud rendering, there's plugins. So if this works out, we may make a standalone free. It's, it's a first step into that direction, but Octane VR has a purpose. It is not just a free version of Octane. It's to get people to start creating the things that you should go to our booth and see. It, 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 you know, Karma's raving about it. I mean, it is an incredible delta from anything that we've ever seen. I mean, it's like going from black and white to color or, you know, silent to sound. It's that kind of extra dimension for cinema that I think is, deserves its own attention and focus. Um, but that being said, none of this works without us solving every other problem in the rendering pipeline, the traditional rendering pipeline. And if you looked at that holographic rendering test we did for keloid, can't do that in 2.0. We're not going to add it to 2.0. That requires pretty much a, a lot more work in Octane. And we're done with 2.0. So we want to make sure that's a production-ready, stable render. So that basically means we need to do a new version of Octane. And um, I want to introduce you to Octane 3, uh, which is a huge step up from what we had before. I, mean, I guess when we're looking at 2, we, we did succeed, I think, in making a production-ready render. To me, the DLR test was, was an important test run for that. With three, we want to have a mature render. I mean, there's, there's, there's you know, renders that have been used for decades, and there's a lot of features in those things that are little things, but they matter and they add up. And with Octane 3, we wanted all of that in there. And we also wanted to break the whole render so we could add major new features that we just couldn't do last year, and we shouldn't have done last year. I think that it's, we have a solid product, but this, with Octane 3, we're going to do a lot of crazy stuff. So the first thing I think a lot of users probably will expect this is we're going to add full volumetric support. This is a native primitive type in Octane, so yeah, again, cloud rendering literally is you know, easy. Um, and it's very powerful and it's very fast. Um, and along with that, we've opened the door to a whole other type of, of rendering, right? I mean, it's, there's, there's primitive types that are now, other than, you know, than polygons and, and points and, uh, and, and uh, fur, that is possible now with this kind of system. And it's, it, it opens the door, for example, to snow, to mist, gas, 
um, organic materials. Fractal is flaking something we've never seen in any, any other renderer. It's something that we created basically a whole plot. And it's amazing. I mean, it gives you these very fast renders. This is one polygon, and you have basically unlimited detail. Um, and things become that are organic and super simple to render. Um, and these are just you know, examples of what you can do with that. And things that are you know, like this, this kind of organic shape is, is, is simple. Um, what's, well, the other thing that we knew we had to do um, it is basically get um, full support for particles. And the way we want to do that is through open VDB support. That is now native and option, just like the link, because that's a huge feature. Um, and basically, open VDB means that you can create simulations and other programs and bring them in uh, to Octane 3. Um, this is huge, and we have this working in Brigade. So Brigade is our sandbox for testing a lot of features before we bring them into Octane, which is the more mature product. Open shader language, right? This is an Arnold that's out there, but it's, I haven't seen it really well applied in a GPU <laughs> rendering context because it's tough to do. But we have a working Brigade, and the speed is the same. And just like out of core rendering, we think it's going to work in Octane exactly that way. And we've done some tests, and it looks really good. So with open shader language, you can create your own uh, primitives, materials, reflectance, uh, GRDFs. It's all there. And, uh, and it's very powerful, and it really makes Octane, it puts it in a whole other class, and it also unlocks something that's been a problem for four years, which is Octane's uh, built-in procedurals were just our own, and now you can create anything and apply things from the Blender, open Shader community to, to this. But getting to work in the GPU is, is awesome. Um, the other thing that we're gonna be doing is expanding the devices we support to include OpenCL. So we, with Octane 3, because we changed everything, and broke and rewrote everything, we basically now have an intermediate layer, so we don't, I'll directly to CUDA, we can pop to an intermediate format, same with Brigade, and that can target CUDA, OpenCL. With OpenCL, it's, it's not the, you know, the reason, one of the reasons why we're doing this is that we don't want to think too much more about how to do out of core geometry rendering. We can use the OpenCL um, on a CPU to basically solve that problem. It's also going to be a free version of Octane 3 that you can use anywhere. A notebook doesn't have a GPU, for example, and therefore your Octane licenses can then be applied towards GPUs on an appliance or in the cloud. Um, we also are adding support for FBS because the Linux data set is just too heavy. DTEX support is also being added. Um, and from here on, there's just a, a litany of, of huge features. Probably it's best to go through them and, and you know, if there's questions, we can go through that and do it. And, and the pixel rendering, um, another major feature that we've been working on for a while, there's now a live bridge so you can actually run Octane in mass and in real time change the scene and see it in new. Uh, we're building our own Photoshop plugin from scratch. It's going to ship for free with Octane, and it's going to bring deep pixel rendering, live deep pixel updating into Photoshop. That is huge. Um, the reason we also held back our Unreal plugin, we're also doing a Unity plugin, was that we wanted to get texture baking working and build a whole system around that. And it's a big feature, um, and it basically can replace light mass in UE4. It can, it can do texture baking for any engine. Um, but one of the things that we thought we should do was, was get it working independently of these things. So you can actually now create and bake a scene into a, a media file that can be played back on the web in VR without any other engine. It's very simple. Um, and the other thing that we fix, unlimited mesh sizes and primitive tests. There's an infinite amount of detail and polygons you can throw at Octane. Uh, raw lighting and albedo pass is another production feature that was a small thing, but we needed to add that. Uh, a lot of users asked for you know, controlling reflections. Um, it was hard to do that without breaking the physically correct nature of Octane, but we did it. And in the standalone, there'll be fully configurable UI, gizmos to move objects around, um, and you can undock and undock windows. Um, we're also expanding the Lua scripting nodes and API to support native plugins and LLVM portable code as well. Um, so beyond just the core rendering features, we're creating a new media file for it. And the reason why we're doing that, just similar to how we did with Orbex scene files, which basically expand upon the LeanVic and, and cover things that just aren't in those industry standard formats, this is designed to cover output from Octane. And if, you, if we depended solely on, on, for example, EXRs, multi-layer EXRs, those are open in Photoshop. I mean, you just get a black screen. So we knew we had to do something to fix that, and we created a full file format around that that exports from Octane that, you know, it can include EXRs, but it handles all the compositing pieces. It handles caching of render data. You can now pause and resume renders, which is a huge feature that a lot of people ask for. Um, and it adds things like movies as textures. You can now have per primitive, per node timelines in Octane. And uh, more importantly, this is how we're going to introduce light field rendering in Octane. I mean, basically now you can take a render target, convert it to a light field, and you can bring it back, assign it to something like a portal texture, and you've got something pretty special. You have a holographic texture at that point. Um, and there's, there's some really cool stuff that we're doing. So we're open sourcing this file format, and it will play back on, in a browser. 
Um, we're obviously going to be targeting the Gear VR. We're also looking at Microsoft HoloLens, no reason we can't look around on all those things. And I think that there's, there's it's probably too much to get into, but there's going to be a whole set of interactive features with the scripting notes that allow you to create full on, you know, published content. And so we're testing that with Warner Brothers. We're actually building this backcade experience, this a full thing that we're pushing out of the Gear VR, and it's built all in Octane. Uh, and it's all using this new file format. Um, so the timeline pricing, we're, we're basically going to do this differently than we did with Octane 2. It's going to be very transparent. So the alpha, you know, we're not going to have a closed beta. We're going to leave to everybody that's an existing 2.x customer as soon as we're at alpha state, which will be probably around June. And the final release will be sometime later this year. It could be in late summer. It could be in quarter three. Where it depends. It depends how we now, if we nail all these features and there's no issues, then it'll probably be in summer. Um, but you know, you look at the list of these features, and it's a lot of work. So it's like a 15 to 16 month timeline. We're going to be working on this stuff into 2016. Um, but a lot of the earlier features, the big ones that we showed in the 3.0 slides, those will be coming hopefully in the summer. Um, plugins, again, there we have 21 plugins and growing, and we're adding ZBrush. Um, we're at this point, we're also looking to get other developers to um, take on the Octane SDK and really build new things around it. Houdini is almost out of beta. Um, we are pretty far along with After Effects. Motion Builder is almost out of beta and works really nicely. Uh, and then we have developers that come to us and say, can we do a price plug? Sure. Uh, Hexagon, same thing. Um, Hawking, one of our you know, top developers, is looking at Fusion 360. Um, Unity is really just going to be a, a sim very similar uh, integration that we, to what we're doing with, with, uh, with Unreal, and it's going to focus a lot on how we handle texture making, which is super useful for game engines. Um, we've talked about the cloud service for two years now, and we had to wait until Octane 3 was ready for a number of reasons. I think one of the things that really is key is pausing and resuming renders. You know, if we didn't have that, uh, the cloud service wouldn't be economically the, where we wanted it to be. Um, but we're splitting this in two different segments, right? Both of them will be web based. If you go to org.oto.com, and some of our users are actually on the service, they've been beta testing it and they love it. Um, it allows you to upload a scene, and it's amazing for anything that takes a lot of time, even in Octane, right? If you have a ton of animation work or you're rendering light fields, you know, this is, this is the service for you, and it's inexpensive. We're keeping it free for at least the next three or four months. Um, but, you know, we're, we're targeting something that could be really, uh, you know, an order management cheaper than building your own render farm. Uh, we have a second version of the cloud service that is on desktop.ota.com, and that is where you can actually run and author apps with Octane and anything we run in XIO. Um, so if you want to do it all in a browser, it's possible. So I want to show you guys a video of Quartz, the Octane Render Cloud Service, and how it operates. Um, so here's basically, it's, it's a very simple interface, but it is very powerful. You upload your Rebecca scenes, export from any of the plugins, basically set your render target settings, and you know, here's an animation being filled in uh, from the cloud. This is all running on Amazon, but we are also supporting our own racks in LA, which is built on a few keys where it's, it's, it's interesting to do that. Um, and uh, and this, is, this is pretty cool. I mean, we can set hundreds or, or, or potentially even thousands of GPUs, and you can pay for what you want. It depends on how many frames of animation you want, not just how fast you want one frame to render. Um, so we're dealing with these massive spatial data sets for light, for light fields or big animations. Um, this is going to be awesome. And the last thing that I want to um, touch on in the cloud service, and this is really <coughs> an interesting uh, capstone to the ecosystem that we're building, is we talked a lot about Orbex being the interchange format. Um, and many of you have been asked about Brigade. So the reason why that was something that we wanted to wait on was because we wanted Brigade to be able to load Orbex scenes right from Octane, and really waiting until it matured to where it is with you know, Octane 3. And that both Brigade and Octane can basically use OpenSL materials. So you know, that OpenSL material so that means that basically now have the same material system and Brigade is going to find its primary use as a cloud service. We've been saying this for a while. It's great on four GPUs, but it is insane when you have a half a rack and you can do anything you want dynamically with no noise. Like that's that's running. It's expensive. I mean, it's half a rack, but that's something that is useful to a lot of high-end customers and potentially game developers. I mean, the budgets for games are insane. So uh, if you're doing a shared virtual world and you want to have unbiased path tracing, live, <coughs> if it's fully dynamic where things can explode, you have the same control you have in DX. Yeah, there you go. Um, and this is something that is nascent. We, we've been working on getting this going on Amazon. It's going to be part of the Octane Render Cloud service. And I guess um, it'll probably be something that we'll expose to as a beta uh, to existing users of the cloud service later this year. Um, so I think that covers a lot of what we wanted to touch on. I think, I'm sure there are probably some questions. Um, I think it's, if there's anyone that wants to ask anything, I'm happy to answer if you have any questions you have now. How's how am I doing time wise? All right, good. Five. Oh my God, perfect. Yeah.
So is the uh, VR version evolving into a real-time render, or is it already there? It's going to start its life as an offline render, and, and, and the reason why is that I think, again, <laughs> that question will be asked when you see what this looks like. You don't want to mess with it. I mean, the thing is, we can make Optane faster, we can make your gate run in real time on a VR device, but the thing is, Optane looks so good when you render a light field or an image, that that experience alone is simple, it's amazing, and we want to cover that with Octane VR. We will definitely work on real-time VR rendering with the baking system in Octane 3. That is where we can start doing those kind of features. Time for one more? Oh, here we go. Yeah. What was the data footprint and size of the actual light fields you were rendering? I can answer that. So the one that, so the two-meter light field is about by megabytes with pristine quality and it includes not just the light field itself, but you know, I've seen these holographic media files include depth, material information, by megabytes for something that you can walk within a CB1. So that's it's really small. And that also can support motion, other things, eight-dimensional light field rendering. Once we're actually you know compressing the radiance data, everything else is actually pretty small. One more, one more. Okay, back here. This might be a little bit stupid question, but when can I put Octane Render on a major website, on the first website? When can I put it on IKEA.com, for example? I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear that question. When, when can I put the Octane Render live on IKEA.com? When can I render it complete, uh, complete uh, home in real time? So if you wanted to do that, I suggest you talk to our guys. We have a service called x.io, which Octane, part of the Octane Cloud which is running on that. And you can create an uh, iframe and put it on your site and load any or best you did in that, and that will solve, I think, the problem you're looking to, to resolve with this. So it can be done, and we can help you with that. And it can handle 50,000 concurrent users. It runs on Amazon, it scales, yeah, it scales as high as you want. And Amazon is a great partner. If we ever run out of GPUs, they've committed to adding more. So I think we're in good shape with them. And we would be very happy to sell yes. some more. <laughs> any, other, any other questions? Thank you very much, Jules. That was amazing.